So to start looking at the overall physiology of the cardiovascular system, we first still need to look at the structure and function of the blood vessels. So we're going to quickly go through some of the structures, including the wall of the blood vessels, the different kinds of capillaries that we see, how we can control blood flow through capillaries, and then finally, how do we get blood back to the heart, given that the, by the time the pressure gets to the veins, um, is really low, so we need to have some special structures to help with that process. So let's first just get some general ideas about blood vessels. First of all, just remember that all gas and chemical exchange takes place in the capillaries. There's no gas exchange, no nutrient exchange taking place in any other blood vessel other than the capillary. The other blood vessels are pretty much to get the blood from point A to point B. That is to get the blood to the capillaries or get the blood from the capillaries back to the heart. So we need to regulate that blood flow and we have a lot of homeostatic mechanisms to do that. And of course we're going to return the blood back to the heart. Now blood vessels have to be resilient to withstand changes such as when the ventricles contract where you need to have be able to have um, the blood vessels withstand that big pressure that's being exerted by the blood, uh, pushing it into the arteries there. Also, we're going to use the blood vessels to store blood. We can actually divert blood from the venous side to the arterial side um, to help in, if we, in blood loss or in exercise to be able to either maintain pressure or provide more oxygen, depending on which we're looking at. The vascular components, of course, the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins going away from the heart and then back to the heart. However, remember, this isn't the only circulatory system we've got. There's lymphatic vessels, our lymphatic system. The lymphatic system picks up excess fluids in the interstitial um, spaces around the tissues, and then that fluid is going to travel through the lymphatic system and then end up dumping that fluid into um, the blood. The walls of the blood vessels consist of three layers. First of all is the tunica intima. That layer is the inside most layer of the blood vessel. It has endothelium which is just continuous with the um, same layer, the endothelial layer of the heart. So we have one nice smooth layer through the entire cardiovascular system. Then there's the tunica media, which is mostly smooth muscle to be able to control um, vasoconstriction and dilation. And then there's the tunica adventitia, which is also called the externa. This has mostly collagen fibers for support and protection. And if the blood vessels are very large blood vessels, so that simple diffusion from the lumen in the inside here, getting nutrients or oxygen diffused through is just too thick. We need a little miniature circulatory system for those large vessels, and that's what's called the vasa vasorum. Looking at the different kinds of blood vessels and what they are composed of, we can see we basically have two kinds of arteries. One is elastic arteries, and you can see here that the, in the blue they have a lot of elastic tissue, so they can stretch better or expand and recoil. These are going to be the big arteries like the aorta, pulmonary trunk, or pulmonary artery. They have to be able to withstand that huge pressure when the ventricles constrict, um, so therefore they've got to uh, be able to stretch and then recoil back. The muscular arteries include most of the other arteries that you name in lab. Um, these have more smooth muscle, you can see here, and less um, elastin, and we're going to use these to, uh, to control vasoconstriction, or the diameter of those blood vessels. The arterioles are pretty much a single layer of smooth muscle cells around the endothelial lining. There's not much more to them than that. And we're going to use those to control minute-to-minute -minute blood flow into the capillary beds. And then there's the capillaries. The capillaries are just endothelium, therefore, of course, exchange of nutrients and waste. And then the venules, these are a little larger than the arteries and a little bit more smooth muscle to them. And so some control over their diameter, particularly in the larger ones. And then finally, the veins. The veins you can see here have more 
um, of the collagen fibers. Um, and you can see also that it has a much larger lumen compared to the arteries. Um, and this, therefore, we can accommodate a lot more blood and there, the veins can then act as a blood reservoir or a storage of the blood in case needed for, um, again, hemorrhage or exercise. This slide just simply shows a comparison of the two. Again, you can see the really thick layer in a artery and a smaller lumen. Here, the veins match thinner layers, much bigger lumen, and also you notice that there's these special structures or valves that are gonna help with one directional flow in those veins, which we'll come back to later. Now the different types of capillaries are dependent on which organ we're looking at and the function of that organ. One type of capillary is a continuous capillary. In this one, the adjacent cells are joined by tight junctions here, or just, or just think of them as um, locations where we can hold these cells together. Spaces in between then the capillary cells are called um, intercellular clefts. Again, these are basically gaps between the cells that are not held together by the tight junctions. And so they're small enough to allow passage of fluids and small molecules only. Um, so the cell, not everything has to diffuse through the cells themselves. Now the blood brain barrier, however, lacks intercellular clefts. Um, this is the capillaries of the brain. Uh, and so we want to make sure we tightly control what makes it into the brain. And so all the cells of the brain capillaries have tight junctions completely sound, surrounding them. That way we don't have these intercellular clefts to allow these molecules or a lo little bit larger molecules to get through. Only way you can get it through into the brain through the capillaries is to actually go through the cells themselves. So we can really, again, tightly control what's going to move through those uh, capillaries and enter our brain tissue. Now the fenestrated capillaries have a little bit bigger um, intercellular clefts and they have pores or what are called fenestrations which you can see here dotting all over the place. These pores are covered with like a delicate membrane they think might be the basal lamina but just think of it as like a little thin layer of cellophane. This gives it the fenestrated capillaries um, more permeability or it's more permeable to fluids and small solutes so things can move through there. We see these more in the small intestine, endocrine organs, and kidneys where you just need a little bit more absorption or filtration of, of um, substances in and out of the blood. The sinusoidal capillaries you can see have huge inter intercellular clefts and, because they have very few tight junctions and they also have very large fenestrations. These things are very leaky, so they're gonna allow large molecules and even blood cells to pass between them. We'll find these in the liver. If you remember back when we looked at digestive system, the capillaries were actually called sinusoids. And then in the bone marrow, of course, so we can move the blood vessels, or excuse me, the blood um, cells that we just made out. And then in the spleen or the adrenal medulla, you'll also find sinusoidal types of capillaries. Now, typically blood moves through what are referred to as capillary beds. So here is this capillary bed. So in other words, you'll see it comes in as an arterial and then notice a quick branching out into all sorts of capillaries, so not just one capillary, and then collects up and moves through the venules. Now, the we need to be able to control the blood moving through those capillaries and that's where precapillary sphincters come in. These are smooth muscles that surround the entrance into the capillary bed at the arterial end and they're going to regulate the blood flow. These are going to be controlled by chemicals and vasomotor nerve fibers to limit blood flow through those capillaries so that if the capillary, these precapillary sphincters are open, notice blood can move through. If they are closed or constrict, then we can shut the blood off into the capillaries and instead the, cap, the blood will just go through what is called a metarterial thoroughfare channel or sometimes you'll hear it called a vascular shunt. This end of it here in the red area is called the metarterial 
The blue end here is called the thoroughfare channel. Again, it's just basically a bypass to bypass blood through the capillary bed without any kind of nutrient exchange going on there. And it may be, say, we aren't using our muscle for some reason, or we're not digesting food. There's no point in having blood move through there. Now, it doesn't have to be an on-off system. It could be just slightly constricted or slightly dilated in those precapillary sphincters just to lower the amount of blood um, going into that capillary bed. There are other routes, too, that we can see through the vascular system so here's the blood coming down into an arterial it could pass through a metarterial thoroughfare channel or vascular shunt that's just one of the types of what are called vascular anastomoses again these vascular anastomoses are basically interconnections if you have an arterial anastomoses that's going to be just an artery to an artery and that allows for different routes of blood um, to move through arteries to finally get to capillaries. So it's just alternative routes um, in case maybe one artery is blocked. It's good to have a backup route to get blood past that blockage and therefore still out to the capillary beds. The arterial venous anastomoses are the ones that's going to go from artery to vein. So the thorough, metacarterial thoroughfare channel is an example of that. And then you can also have a venous anastomosis where you have vein to vein. And that's again an alternative route to have blood um, returning back to the heart on different routes. And we have a lot of those actually if you look on the inside of your wrist. Um, you could probably see an example of a venous anastomosis. So now when blood's coming back from the veins and it's very low pressure, we need to get that blood up from our legs or arms that are hanging down. And so they have to go up against gravity and that's pretty tough to do. So we have structures in play to help with that. One of those is a respiratory pump. Now the respiratory pump works in this way when you inspire inhale you make create a negative pressure inside your thoracic cavity think of it like a vacuum so that really draws your blood vessels out or expands the blood vessel out and so now the diameter of the blood vessel gets bigger and so it sucks the blood up into the thoracic cavity when you expire or an exhale now you create more of a positive pressure in there and so that's going to squeeze those blood vessels so you can see the blood vessels kind of expand and then contract, expand and contract. And that, in a sense, acts like a pump. There's also a skeletal muscle pump where the skeletal muscles, when they contract, they push the blood from one section up to the next. And so contracting and relaxing the muscles will act like a pump. And what keeps the blood moving in the right direction then are all these little valves that we see throughout the vein. So as soon as the muscle contracts, that pushes blood up to the next level, and then you can see the valve collapses or shuts, so that blood that's now up at the higher level simply can't go down to a lower level. It stays higher up, and then a muscle up there will contract it and shoot it up the next level. And that's the same effect that you'll see with the respiratory pump. By, con by squeezing it, you'll push it up, and then the valve prevents them from going back down.